Thanks for stopping by Cross My Heart Ministry. We want to say thank you to all of our regular subscribers. And if you are a regular subscriber, then you get an email each week when we post a new video. If you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and click that big red button, and then you'll get that weekly notification as well. Well, during the last few weeks, we've worked our way through the book of 2 Samuel. We follow David on his journeys. We've seen David ascend to the throne. We've seen David commit a couple of horrific sins. One of those is where we're ending this week. Now, it seems a little odd to end on kind of a negative note as we see this decision that David made to walk in pride by conducting that census and counting all of his men. So we unpacked the subject of pride and really looked at the fact that pride is so insidious. And pride is sort of at the root of all the other sins because pride is the ultimate in rejecting God, stealing glory from God, and really making it all about me. We may think we're immune from pride. You've walked with the Lord many years. That's not me. That's not who I am. But all of us really are vulnerable to leaning into pride. When we begin those sentences, I want, I need, when all of our thought life or our conversations are peppered with the pronouns, me, myself, and I, we may be crossing that line into pride, making it all about us, taking the spotlight off of God. Isaiah 43, 7 makes it clear that we were created for the express purpose of bringing glory to God. And so perhaps that's why pride heads up God's list of the seven things that he hates. At the top of that list in Proverbs are haughty eyes, and haughty eyes indicate a prideful heart. So we hope you'll stay tuned and listen to the teaching lecture in its entirety as we look at David's sin of walking into pride, how he repented, how he was convicted, he confessed his sin, God forgave it, but also doled out some serious consequences. But David accepted those consequences. He never became angry with God. He confessed, he repented, and then he wrapped up by worshiping God and praising him. Ladies, I believe that worship is the antidote for pride. I believe that if we keep our eyes on God and we keep walking in worship, that's the best protection against pride because we can't simultaneously keep our eyes on ourselves and what we want and what we need and also have our eyes focused on God. The interesting thing about the place that David selects to build that temple, the direction that he's given for where to build the temple, the threshing floor that he purchases, that land and that spot become the exact place where the temple will someday be built. David's two big sins that are recorded in scripture. First, the sin with Bathsheba that we studied earlier, and we'll put the link to that below if you want to go back and listen to that teaching lecture as well. And then secondly, this week, in taking that census, counting how many fighting men that he had, both of those sins he committed, they were horrific sins, but he repented. And that's the important thing about our sin. When we listen and we yield to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and we say, yes, sir, and we repent and we confess that sin, God forgives us. It's what you do next that counts. When conviction comes, just say yes, sir, to God. Confess, repent, and receive the blessing of the restoration of that relationship. When David repented with both of those sins, God forgave him. There were still consequences. But with both of them, God brought beauty from ashes. Bathsheba became his wife, and he would eventually, she would eventually give birth to Solomon. That was the line through which the Lord Jesus Christ would come. Solomon would also be the one that got to build the temple for the Lord. And then now the sin with the census led to the procurement of that land where the temple would be built. So both of those sins God used to further his plans and to bring good from what was bad. I'm Laura McFarland. This is Cross My Heart Ministry. Thank you for watching. It's such an encouragement to us when you click that like button and let us know that you like what you're hearing. It encourages us to know that the effort that we are making to bless you is indeed a blessing. And of course, we'd love it when you leave a comment and let us know how what we're teaching and what we're bringing is stirring up your heart or touching your life. We hope you'll stay tuned and watch this week's teaching lecture in its entirety. For Cross My Heart Ministry, I'm Laura McFarland. Thank you for watching our channel. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for checking the like box and leaving us a comment. Both of those things encourage us. They let us know that the teaching we're bringing is resonating and it's making a difference in your life. And if you are new to our channel, also want to call your attention to our new Martha Monday segment. You can look for that a couple of Mondays each month. We're trying to bring some truth or some teaching that is of a practical nature, very pragmatic tips that hopefully will spur you on as you manage hearth and home. The teaching that we bring each week from the Bible is leans more towards Mary. Mary was the one 
that were sitting at the feet of Jesus to learn. And so our teaching each week has leaned more merry. And so we want to bring some practical helps that will hopefully enable you to manage your home and your life uh, in, in a way or a new way that might be a blessing. So you can look for those videos. And again, if you subscribe to our channel, you'll get a, a notification when we post either a new teaching video or a new Martha Monday video. So again, hope you stay tuned and watch this week's teaching lecture in its entirety. For Cross My Heart Ministry, I'm Laura McFarland. Well, are any of you in this room old enough to remember trolls? Did you get those when you were a little girl for Christmas? Maybe you were the generation that collected Beanie Babies, or maybe Webkins, or maybe you bought those for your daughter or your granddaughter. Did you collect Hot Wheels or, or McDonald's Happy Meal toys? Maybe you still have some of those lined up as part of your collection that you never let go of. Or maybe you were like me and you collected Nancy Drew books. <laughs> well, kids of every generation like to collect things toys or books maybe, or, or perhaps when they get older, you were like that and collected uh, stamps or coins or something beyond toys. But it can become even a competition. Have you ever had kids say, ever heard kids say, well, I have 17 be be Beanie Babies. How many do you have? Well, that competitive attitude to couch what you have and be proud when you have more than somebody else we know that's not just an attitude reserved for children. Grown-ups can get in on that kind of action too. Being proud of what we have, counting what we have, trying to outdo everybody else with what we have. You know, there's nothing wrong with having things or resources. But when we begin to keep track and to count, and when we begin to use those things to compare ourselves to others, and when those things we have become the main thing, when we become preoccupied with what we have, and how much we have, then it's very clear that we have crossed the line into pride. The writer of Proverbs actually warns us about pride when he wrote this, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. The thing about pride is that you never really grow up and move beyond its reach. We can never say that we mature beyond the point that it can't reach out and grab us. We may grow in humility. We may grow closer to the Lord. We may grow in understanding and knowledge. But in our humanness, we will always be susceptible to pride. Even when we kick it out the front door, pride has this sneaky way of going around back and coming in through the back door in ways that might catch us off guard. Even in his twilight years, when David, King David, that we've studied throughout the books of First and now Second Samuel, all those victories, all those years of walking with the Lord, when David, at this stage in his life, has filled his journal with all these beautiful psalms that are, that are now canonized as part of Scripture for us to study and enjoy and, and use to praise God and, and pray back to God, all these years later, David is still vulnerable to pride, even after he's learned so much and walked through so much with God. We see it in this week's text. So I would like you to stand with me in honor of God's word as we look at the role that pride played in David's life, even during this late time in his mature years. I'm reading in 2 Samuel chapter 24, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 17. <clears throat> Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab and the army commanders with him, Go throughout the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over, and may the eyes of my lord the king see it. But why does my lord the king want to do such a thing? The king's word, however, overruled Joab and the army commanders, so they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. After crossing the Jordan, they camped near Aror, south of the town in the gorge, and then went through Gad and on to Jazer. They went to Gilead in the region of Tatim Hodshi, and on to Dan John and around Sidon. Then they went towards the fortress of Tyre and the towns of the Hivites and the Canaanites. Finally, they went on to Beersheba in the Negev of Judah. After they had gone through the entire land, they came back to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to the king. 
In Israel, there were 800,000 able-bodied who could handle a sword, able-bodied men who could handle a sword, and in Judah, 500,000. David was conscience-stricken after he had counted the fighting men, and he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, O Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad the prophet, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, Shall there come upon you three years of famine in your land, or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you, or three days of plague in your land? Now then, think it over and decide what I should answer the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I'm in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but do not let me fall into the hands of men. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated, and 70,000 of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord was grieved because of the calamity and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I am the one who has sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall upon me and my family. Ladies, thank you for standing in honor of God's word. You may be seated. And let me just pray for us as we begin today. Oh, Lord God Almighty, we have traveled through the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. And as we come to the end, in some ways, Lord, it it feels like we're ending on on a, a down note as we see David committing this grievous sin. As we study this text, Father, and we read how this man after your own heart has committed this grievous sin, we see that he's conscience stricken. We see how you move and work in his life. We see the truth that sin must be atoned for here. But, Father, let this be an encouragement to us as we see that it's what we do next that counts. Let us be convicted that when we find ourselves in sin that we need to, in our stricken conscience, come back and confess. Let us realize, Father, that with you, forgiveness is always possible. So, Lord, as we dive into the difficult subject of pride today, Lord, we just invite you to shine the light into our hearts to reveal even to these women who have known you and loved you many years as David did, Father, would you just show us where we might be holding back? Would you show us that that dark corner where we have given everything to you, but we're holding something back? We've we've held that back from you. And, And God, today we want to be women of God who hold it all out. Would you shine your light of truth and give us that opportunity to repent and confess and walk out in freedom and lightness, knowing that you are faithful to cleanse us from that unrighteousness when we ask. You are a good and faithful God. And Lord, I just pray today that as we study this text, it wouldn't just be an academic or an historical study, but it would be one that makes us uncomfortable and brings conviction, and we just invite your Holy Spirit to illuminate those areas of our lives that we, as women of God, that want to be women who, who seek after your heart, that we can deal with those things. Would you do business with us today, Holy Spirit? Would you just, Father, we ask that the Spirit of God would take this word of God and stir up our hearts and leave us here committed and determined to confess all things and to bring all things before you. You are good and you are great, and we declare our love for you. Amen. Well, chapter 24 opens with a... A a, a passage or a little phrase that I think, if you're like me, left you just a little troubled or or maybe bothered or uneasy. And so I thought I might just address that as a little side note before we jump into the the topic of pride that that I feel led to address today. Um, in, In verse one, it says this, again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel and he incited David against them saying, go and take a census of Israel and Judah. There are no details given as to why the Israelites have done this thing to bring the Lord's displeasure. Um, Some of the scholars that I read suggested that it was their support of Absalom, that, that, they had, that Absalom and the people that had followed him had rebelled against God's anointed. So the reason that, that God is angry with Israel is because they had gone against his clear uh, 
his clear leading and um, anointing of David. Going against David was to go against him. So that's why God was angry. But the troubling part for me here is that phrase that he incited David against them. And so is, is God inciting David to walk in this sin of pride? And, and that just makes us feel a little uneasy or uncomfortable or, or leads us to ask what's going on here. So when we find difficult passages, when we see those things in Scripture that just sort of give us pause or make us sort of wonder, it's always helpful, I think, to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture to not just rely on that one little skinny little verse, but maybe go look at parallel passages. And so that's, that's what I did. So I want to look at some other scriptures that might be helpful here. Over in 1 Chronicles 21.1, and this is a parallel passage to what we're studying in 2 Samuel. In chapter 21, verse 1, it says this, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. Here's what I learned in my study. The ancient Hebrews made no distinction between God's active will and his permissive skill, His permissive will. So allowing scripture to interpret scripture can lead us to safely assume that Satan did the prompting and Satan did the, the inciting here of, of this wicked thing. God allowed it. God in his sovereignty allowed that. He gives us free will to choose. And then David willingly, willfully, gave in to that temptation. In James 1.13, it is confirmed that when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. You know, we, we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. And so our loving obedience to God is what he is owed. And, and, the, and that should characterize our lives and the decisions that we make. I think the lesson and the takeaway here for us is that when we find something that troubles us, we keep on studying. We keep allowing scripture to interpret scripture. We have to be careful about pulling out an isolated verse or making a broad assumption. So on to David's sin now. First, I want to summarize some general truths about sin. And these are just things that I think all of us can agree on. And if you're a woman of God and a woman of the word, you would agree with all these things about sin. First of all, God takes it very seriously. God takes sin seriously. And so, therefore, we should take it seriously. Uh, sin is what sin must be atoned for. Sin is what sent Jesus to the cross. Our sin rarely affects just us. It's, it, it typically affects other people. When we commit this one sin, we do not live in an island. It ripples out in ways that we sometimes couldn't even begin to imagine the way it's going to affect our children or our spouse or our communities and our families. Sin separates us from God. God is holy. And, and if sin were permitted in his presence, he would cease to be holy. Um, sin um, must be atoned for. It, there, there, a price has to be paid. And that atonement can only come from, from blood. And so as we look at these just sort of ground rules, these are the things that are sobering but true about, about sin. God is holy, and, it, and he would cease to be holy if sin were permitted in his presence. If you and I were to bake a pan of brownies, and we used only the freshest of ingredients, we went out to the hen house and gathered the eggs, and, and we milked the cow if there's milk in your brownie recipe, and we went to the store and bought all fresh, organic ingredients, and we made these delicious, wonderful brownies. And if I told you that as I mixed up the batter with that mixture before I put it in the oven, I put in just a smidgen, just one sixteenth of a, of a teaspoon, just barely a little bit of dog poop to the batter, just a little bit, that smidgen, well, would that taint the whole batch when I'd used all these fresh, delightful, wonderful ingredients? Well, of course it would. We'd have to throw out the whole batch because one teeny little minuscule amount taints the whole thing. And that's the best analogy that I can think of to describe God's holiness. He is perfect. And if we were permitted in heaven with our sinfulness, our presence there would taint his holiness. No sin can be allowed in his presence. And, and ladies, really, we want him to be a God of justice. We would not tolerate a judge, a judge who just winked at sin in a court of law and said, oh, it's okay. He is not a doting grandfather. He is a holy and righteous God. He is great. He is great and righteous and holy. 
but he's also a God who is good. He's a God of love uh, as well as righteousness. He fulfilled his own law when Jesus died and the sacrifice was made. And so it's his justice that must be satisfied, but it's his love that came up with the way to have that justice satisfied and the sacrifice met. It had to be God because the sacrifice had to be perfect. And man was, was not perfect. It required the perfect sacrifice. But it had to be man because man was the one who sinned. So Jesus uniquely fits the bill. He is the God-man. I had a professor in college who described it as God can but should not and man should but cannot. And so Jesus is the God-man who fully satisfies both requirements. Only Jesus, uniquely Jesus, the God-man, satisfies the righteous requirements of the law. Love is what sent him to the cross. So when we sin against a God who gave all that for us, It is the ultimate in ungratefulness. It's the ultimate in rebellion. When conviction comes, we should repent immediately, and we should keep those accounts short. I tend to agree with William Barclay, who said this about the sin specifically of pride. Pride is the ground on which all the other sins, on which all the other sin grows, and the parent from which all the other sins come. I'm convinced that if If all of our sin was some big twisted knot, if we found ourselves in this mess and we tried to untangle and unravel all the the motivations and the situations and the mindsets that took us to commit that sin that, that resulted in all these different things going on, at the very core of that, if we unraveled the whole thing, I think would be the sin of pride. That virtually every, if not every sin, is somehow leads back to the attitude of pride. If I become angry because you didn't say or do what I wanted you to say or do, well, that's pride because you didn't do what I wanted you to do. If I'm pouting because I wasn't made much of and I wasn't honored or I wasn't thanked or appreciated, well, here again, that's pride. If I'm in a huff because the award or the honor or the job or or the scholarship or the promotion went to somebody else's kid or husband, or son-in-law, then we see that pride even kicks in when we take up that offense for those we love. Anytime we make it all about me, well, ladies, that's pride. Pride was even behind the very first sin committed by our mother Eve. Back in Genesis 3, the serpent was so crafty when he entered this beautiful, perfect garden that God had prepared. It says he was more crafty than any of the wild animals that God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? He's getting her to doubt God's word, first of all. And then she says, she repeats God's rule. We may eat from any tree, from, from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, here's the the thing, and I've got it in red. That's my uh, highlighting added to get your attention. Your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now... You will be like God. That's pride. That's pride. Raw, selfish, ambitious pride. You will be like God. I can be like God, Eve thought. I can be like God if I just take a bite of this. So she took another look. She looked at that fruit a second time, and then she took the first bite. And as is most often the case with sin, it rippled out and affected others, and she gave it to her husband, and he ate it. So... To coin a phrase from Neil Armstrong, we can say that was one small bite for woman, but one giant leap of sin for all mankind, and certainly womankind. Sin entered the world when the evil one tempted God's creation. Pride was his tool of choice. You know, God could have left that tree out of the garden. He could have just removed it, and then there would have been no possibility for them to sin. He could have just made, it, could have made the garden per- perfect and kept it perfect by removing even the possibility for sin. But God doesn't force us to love him. He wants us to choose to love him. He desires our loving obedience. It was pride that ensnared Eve. It was pride that that grabbed David at this week's text. Pride was even used by the evil one later to try to trip up Jesus. 
Eve gave in to the sin of pride when she ate that apple. And because it worked effectively, Satan keeps using that same tool over and over again. In Matthew 3, Jesus launched his ministry, his earthly ministry. He presented himself to John the Baptist to be baptized first and set that example for us. And that's a a beautiful and unique passage in Scripture because we see all three members of the Godhead present at the the baptism of Jesus. Jesus is, of course, there. The Spirit descends as a dove. God the Father, his voice speaks from heaven. This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. So surely that was a mountaintop high for Jesus in his earthly form here on earth. And it's often the case with spiritual highs for us you know, you, you go to that ladies' retreat, or you've been at this great worshipful church service, and then suddenly it's right after that that things come crashing down and things go sideways. Well, that's what happened to Jesus. There's this big spiritual high to his baptism, and it was followed by that huge challenge. Because in Matthew 4, it opens with Jesus being led out into the wilderness where he was tempted by the evil one. Satan first began by trying to get Jesus to doubt his identity. He said, if you are the Son of God. And both times Jesus resisted by quoting scripture. The word of God is our offensive weapon when the enemy wants to trip us up too. And when that didn't work, Satan tried the third time to tempt Jesus. And here's what he said. In Matthew 4, 8 to 10, we read this. Again, the the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus resisted that temptation in his humanness. It was a real temptation. We have to know that. But he set the example for us by using scripture to resist the evil one when he was tempted. So we need to do likewise. We need to keep our sword sharp to do battle. The sword of the spirit, according to Ephesians 6, is the word of God. Pride can lead us to want something so much that we will sacrifice truth and even walk away from God, that we might even worship an idol or a false god to get what we want or what we think we need. 1 John 2.16 says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. We never, ever become immune to pride. No matter how long we walk with the Lord, no matter how long we've known him and called him our Savior, if we think we've arrived at that place of no longer being vulnerable to pride, Well, that's a prideful position in itself. If we come to the place that we just declare, I'm done with pride, it's never going to trip me up again. Each day we get up and we bow down before him. Each day we have to settle and acknowledge that he is God, that we are his servants. And then throughout the course of the day, we must be very wary and mindful of attitudes and behaviors and decisions that have us putting the crown on our head. We have to keep reminding ourselves, that we serve King Jesus, and he is the Lord. Well, when the words from my mouth and your mouth, or the thoughts in my mind and your mind are beginning, I want, or I think, or I need, that should be a warning to us. All those eyes, what I want, what I need, what I desire. When our conversations, when we find ourselves, the words coming out of our mouth and our conversations are peppered with the pronouns me and myself and I, that's time for a reality check. It's time for a pride check because it means that I may have pried that spotlight off of God and I have put it upon myself. It should not surprise us when we find ourselves tempted by pride because even David was led away by it. Note his words to his commanders in 2 Samuel 24.2. So the king said to Joab and the army commanders with him, go throughout the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many there are. You know, what's not here is very telling and very revealing. There's no checking in with God. There's no God honoring reason for what he's doing. There's no instruction given by God to go count the men. It's just so that I may know. It's just David walking in pride. He just wants to know how many soldiers do I have? 
how many fighting men are in my kingdom? And even Joab. Now, we've had some dealings with Joab. We've watched him give some advice and do some things. We've even talked about at the table whose group I sat in on today. Joab is not always known as adhering to the highest standards of moral and ethical behavior. So even Joab, though, thinks this is a questionable idea. He questions the decision. And, 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 and even his question to David is David's way of escape. If he would have listened to Joab, that, that conversation could have been dropped in by God to give him a little time out, to lead him to question that decision. Remember when we looked at this verse earlier in our study in, in 2 Samuel when we talked about temptation and God making a way out? No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God provides an exit. He provided an exit for David. I think that was sort of David's heads up, those words from Joab. You don't want to do this. Is this really something you want to do? Why are you going here? And I believe that when we are tempted to sin, God also provides that way out for us. We just need to look for the exit and take it. The exit door was available, but David refused to take it. He pushed on in his pride. He demanded his own way. He wanted his fighting men counted. So if we have this Holy Spirit abiding in us as women of God, I believe he will also convict us of sin. And he will provide that way of escape for us when we find ourselves with our hand on the mouth poised and ready to go someplace or see something or do something we don't need to see or do. When we find ourselves holding that remote control in our hands, ready to watch something and th- that we know we really shouldn't watch. Ladies, there's a lot of stuff on cable now that I believe is just pornographic. What are we watching? What are we allowing to fill our hearts and minds? When we might find ourselves ready to pick up the phone, to make a phone call we don't need to say, to let words come out that don't need to be said. Maybe we're opening up our mouths live and in person to say something that we don't need to say. And when that conviction comes, we can lay down the phone, lay down the remote, get up and leave that place, close our mouths. Because getting our own way and insisting on doing or saying or getting what we want, that's pretty much the definition of pride. When we disregard the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the clear leading of Scripture, the wise counsel of a friend, we may be setting ourselves up for a fall just as David found himself in a place of making a decision that would set himself and those in his kingdom up for a fall. Proverbs 6, 16 and 17 gives us a heads up about the things that God hates. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes. Haughty eyes. Now the other six are listed there. These are the seven things that God hates. The top of that list is haughty eyes. And haughty eyes denote pride. If we follow God and we want to live for God, we should hate and reject the things that God hates. We should want to purge all those things out of our lives. God hates pride. It's at the top of the list that he detests. But you know what? God loves us more. So during the almost 10 months, 9 months and 20 days, Scripture tells us that it took to conduct the census, I believe that the hound of heaven was chasing David. I believe that God loved David so much that he didn't want to leave him in that place of sin. I believe that during that, those 9 months and, and 20 days that David was restless and uneasy, And I think the decision that he had made was weighing on him. The Lord's conviction was perhaps heavy on his heart. And maybe he had not not just a few sleepless nights. Have you been there? Have you been in a place of doing or saying something, making a decision that you know is not right, and you just find yourself stiff-arming God, not wanting to repent, wanting to ignore that, turning away from God? Well, when David's men came back to report and give the answer to the census and give him his totals, David's conscience is clearly stricken. And we can almost sense anguish in the words that he says, that he speaks to God. The scripture tells us David was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. You know, when conviction comes, we have a choice. 
We have a choice. David had a choice. We can dig our heels in in stubborn pride, and we can continue on our way and just keep doing what we've been doing and doing what we want, or we have the choice to allow the Lord to pierce our heart. Do we yield to his conviction? Do we repent and turn? David owned up to his sin. Do you and I own up to ours? Are we found crying out? Have you ever cried out, not just I have sinned, but I have sinned greatly? Well, ladies, I want to tell you, when conviction comes, it's what you do next that counts. The woman of God repents when convicted. She repents when she can, is, is convicted. I looked up the word repent in, on, at merriamwebster.com, and re, repent is defined as to turn from sin. True repentance is a U-turn. You stop, and you turn around, and you go in another direction. Repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry I did it, God. Repent is a turning around, because talk is really kind of cheap. It cheapens grace when we say, oh, God will forgive me. Action confirms true repentance. Turning away from that sin. Turning away from pride is an act of humility. Pride and humility are polar opposites. They are opposite ends of the spectrum. This is confirmed by James 4, 6, where we read, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Some of us women have strong personalities. I, I, I can identify more than a few of you who would join me in that strong personality club. We don't give up easily. We fight for our rights. We fight for our position. We fight for our family. Um, but let me tell you, we would be wise not to fight against God. We don't want opposition from God. And the sure way to get it is to walk in pride. Because it's the thing that he hates most. God opposes the proud person, but he gives grace when we are humble. A humble heart is a repentant heart, and a humble heart is given grace. I think we would much rather receive grace from God than opposition from God. And so repentance is the way that we get there. When David repents, God forgives but there are still consequences. Our sin brings consequences to ourselves and to others. God was gracious, though, to David. He permitted him to choose the consequences for his sin. He was kind and merciful and allowing David to choose. And he gave him three choices, three different choices that he could pick from as he gave him the options for how he could receive his punishment. And David's reasoning and making his choices sound. He tells us, he says that he would rather be at God's mercy than receive the violence of men. So he asked for three days of plague. And the result is 70,000 people die. And it was overwhelming to David as he looked out and he saw his sin impacting his fellow Israelites. His pride had led to their destruction. This is Proverbs 16, 18 lived out, that pride goes before destruction, literally. And as the angel of the Lord is poised and ready to descend upon Jerusalem, David is just overwhelmed. He can stand it no more. And with great emotion, he begs God to relent. I have sinned. I, the shepherd, have done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. You can just sense the desperation and the anguish as, as David cries out to God. Note his imagery. I, the shepherd, these are the sheep. He, re, he goes back to his roots and who he is. It's overwhelming for us to see those that we love suffer because of our sin. It's the reason that we moms have so many scenes from life that when we think about the mistakes that we made in our parenting and, and in raising our children, we'd love to go back and, and relive those things over, go back and, and get a do-over or, or a take-two like on a movie set. God was gracious to David then. He's gracious to us now. He was merciful, and he is merciful. David is prompted to build an altar, and he buys the threshing floor, and he builds that altar, and he worships the Lord. Verse 25 says that David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and then the Lord answered his prayer in behalf of the land, and the plague on Israel was stopped. The consequences God gives, they didn't make David angry with God. Did you notice that? David knew that God was just in doling out the punishment. He didn't get angry or think that God was unfair or unjust. 
He didn't walk away from God, as, as sometimes we've seen people in our world do. Well, if God's going to do that, I'm just done with God. His fellowship with God is restored. His response then is worship. David owned what he did. He, he repented. He confessed. He took his lumps, and then he worshiped when, when God had answered. He responded to God with grateful praise. Do you and I praise God when he forgives us, when he answers our prayers? The events in 2 Samuel 24 should serve as really a powerful cautionary tale for us. God does indeed take sin very seriously, and we should too. The sin of pride is one that is particularly grievous to him, perhaps because it attempts to steal the spotlight from God. When we indulge in pride, we take our eyes off him. And we try to push him off the throne and, and climb up there and take that place for ourselves. Isaiah 43, 7 makes it clear that we were created to bring him glory. And so perhaps the sin of pride is the one that most messes with us fulfilling that call on our life. If our purpose is to bring him glory, then when we walk in pride, we are doing the exact opposite. When we walk in pride, we are stealing God's glory for ourselves, that which is due to him. So I wonder, is there an area in your life or an area in my life where we are engaging in, in self-indulgence, choosing to sit on the throne, to do what we want, to steal that glory from God. Have you and I failed to recognize God's grace and mercy? Have we perhaps mistakenly assumed that his long-suffering is, is an indication that he's just tolerating or, or winking our sin or just letting it go? Do we need to be reminded that sin always brings consequences, and that our Lord Jesus paid the ultimate consequence for our sin. Just as David was grieved when he realized that others were suffering death because of his sin, so we should feel the weight of what our sin cost our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you and I worshipped and thanked and praised Jesus for that sacrifice? Have we acknowledged what he has done for us? Of course we do that at the moment that we call on him for salvation, that we step into that new relationship and finding our identity in him. But have we made time lately to ponder fresh and anew the magnitude of our sin and the outrageous ransom paid to buy our freedom from that sin? Have you expressed gratitude and praise, and have you done it lately? Have you thanked him this week or even today? Because the woman of God gives grateful praise for God's mercy. First John 1 John 1.9 says that when we confess our sin, God is ever faithful to forgive. We know what unconfessed sin does. It weighs us down. It hinders our relationship with God. It, it, it frustrates the Holy Spirit because God wants to call us back to repentance and restore that relationship. We don't need to carry that stuff around anymore. We need to unload it. We need to give it to God and ask his forgiveness and then worship and praise him for the lightness and the cleanness that comes when he extends grace and mercy in, in, in response to our confession and repentance. David's two greatest sins as recorded in scripture are most likely his two biggies, his sin with Bathsheba and now his sin in taking this, the census. But our great God used both to bring about good. David confessed both of these. He repented both of these. It's recorded in scripture and he receives God's forgiveness. God used both to bring good even from the bad that David had done. David's sin with Bathsheba led to her becoming his wife and eventually giving birth to Solomon, the son to whom, through whom the lineage of Jesus Christ would come, the son who would build the temple to honor and worship God. And his sin in taking the census led to the purchase of the threshing floor on the very spot where that temple would someday be built. What an amazing great God we serve. How good he is to us. Only he can use all the things in our lives, even our mess-ups and our sinful choices. He can forgive those, and then he can use even that for our good and for his glory. You may not find yourself counting the men in your army or counting your Barbies or your beanies, but the temptation to give in to pride is always lurking. It's always ready there to reach out and grab us. Satan keeps pulling pride out of his toolbox. It's either his favorite tool or it just keeps working so he keeps using it. First with Eve, 
Later on with David, he even tried it on our Lord Jesus Christ, and, and, and that didn't work. But knowing our vulnerability to pride should help us stay watchful and mindful. We can be on our guard and take steps to protect ourselves. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, if we keep walking in worship, I think worship is the very best antidote for pride because you can't be looking at yourself and your stuff and what you want and also simultaneously be looking at Jesus. We are protected in our walk and, and from having that detour to pride when we keep walking with him and having our eyes on him. But when we do give in, let's commit to repenting quickly, to not stiff-arming that conviction that comes. Let's just keep running back to our good God in obedient, joyful worship. Ladies, would you pray with me? God, we praise you as a very forgiving and a very kind God. Your scripture tells us that it is your kindness that leads us to repentance. Father, we are sinful women, women who get up in the morning and want to commit to live for you, but women through the course of of decisions and life and, and things that are done to us and things that we do, sometimes we get sidetracked. So, Lord, today we invite you, we ask you, we beg you to convict us when we sin, to call us back to repentance, to shine that light where it needs to be shown and, and to reveal the things that we may have hidden. Let us run back to you to the foot of the cross in joyful repentance and then in joyful worship. Receive the forgiveness that you so freely give. We love you. We thank you. We praise you this day in the name of Jesus. Amen.